the scripture reading this morning is from Romans 8. I'll begin in verse 18 and go through 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to uh, fulfill not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have fruits, first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he's seen but if we hope for what we do not see we wait for it with patience song leading those are some of my favorite songs most of them are choruses and i usually sing them two or three times so i got a lot of time though that's the good news if you left me lots of time here and uh, blessed to be here I wanted to say a few things before we got into the lesson this morning, and one is is that I was reminded recently that we met Charles and Nadia just over a year ago when we went to the Sunset Workshop, went through the administrator's training, and Charles and Nadia were going through that same training, and I, I just want to say that I've fallen more in love with them over that year and the time they've been working with us, uh, like them from the beginning, they just keep growing on me. And with that being said, Charles will be speaking tonight on our youth night, and I encourage you to come back and hear the message that he's prepared. He's doing a great job for you, and I want you to know that. Also, I wanted to mention, I don't spend as much time talking about it as I should. Our North Texas Bible Institute classes meet on Monday nights, and uh, I'm not supposed to be teaching right now, but I am, right, with Paul being out. And I just want to encourage you, if you've not tried one of those, I don't care if you just come and sit in a class. It's not going to hurt me. It's not sure not going to hurt you. And I think you'd be surprised at the quality of those classes. I encourage you just to drop in. We're beginning the divided kingdom. If you want to know more about Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, son of Nebat and all of that, uh, that's where Bible History uh, 2 class will be tomorrow night. Just encourage you to drop in and, um, and check that out. Maybe something you want to do, pick up class. You can come attend the rest of the classes, audit those classes. You may want to pick up a class in the fall. So I want to encourage you to do that. Um, I just have been thinking lately, and what's led us into this series of lessons, and one of the things that occurred to me during our auditorium class, and that's another thing, I'm not here to fuss at you, but I am here to encourage you. Man, I'm going to tell you, the 28-minute video that we watched in this class this morning was so rich, I think I could easily preach for six months in what was in that 28-minute video. Some of the deepest stuff, I mean, I don't know if it had that effect on you, but my mind was racing on all the places to go with that. And I've been thinking about it, and it's what led us to the series of lessons we're in this morning what God has done so powerfully, what Jesus has done so perfectly, and what the Spirit does so persistently in our lives. It's not about what we have done. It's about what God has done. It's about what God is doing. And, and the more that I read and the more that I study, the more lessons I prepared, the more I'm just in awe of God. I don't know how to explain it to you, and it seems odd to me. After 30 years of ministry, I'm standing up going, you know what, guys? I've determined in 30 years of ministry that God is awesome. Now, that should have happened in the first year, right? But I'm telling you there's an impression that God is making on me that is just 
overwhelming me. I, I, I have to believe that it's God who's doing those things. Now, for just a moment, I want to take your mind somewhere else. By show of hands, well, maybe not. If you're comfortable, by show of hands, how many of you get on social media occasionally? Or more than that occasionally? All right. So for you who are on social media, you're going to know what I'm talking about. And for those of you who are not, you're not going to know, and I'll try to explain it. Wait for it. How many of you have received a video that has the caption, wait for it? And so you play this little video, and something very normal looking is happening. And then toward the end of the video, something very unexpected happens, right? So I think the last one I saw, Riley showed me this guy. And I guess somebody's got a helmet cam. There's a bicyclist right in front of the camera. And then you see a bicyclist come around that front bicycle. And he's humming, man. He's going. You know how these guys are, the little shorts and the helmets and the whole bicycle deal. And this guy's humming. He, he just got into first place. And all of a sudden, there's this blur. I mean, just a blur comes flashing across the screen. And he goes from going, whoa, that way real fast, to going, boom, this way real quick, right? I mean, nearly instantaneously, this guy's on the ground. It looks like it knocks him smooth out. And as he hits the ground, you kind of see what the blur is. Uh, th this, this blur hits and lands on its two paws and begins to bounce off. Evidently, these guys are in Australia, and this guy's doing great, and all of a sudden, he is taken out by a kangaroo. And I was thinking, how rude. Oh, I'm sorry, it's my, I couldn't help without a pun, right? Wait for it. All, all of these little videos are showing life just happening in the way that life happens. One thing happens after another. There's a progression of life and our stages of life. And there's something so predictable at times in our, in our lives. But then there are those things that come into our lives that aren't predictable. Trouble that comes in our lives. Difficulties that come into our lives. And we didn't really see it coming. And, and maybe you're in one of those times of life where life is difficult. Maybe you're in one of those times where you can't really see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, and if you do, you're afraid it's a train, right? You just, ah, I'm swimming, I'm bucking the current as hard as I can, I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. And the passage this morning is saying, hey, wait for it. Just wait for it. And if you're watching a minute video and you're thinking, oh, this is boring, this is boring, usually there's a payoff at the end of the video, right? Something happens at the end that I laugh at or am awe of or something. But isn't that life? Hasn't God called us to a life where He says, wait for it? We're going to go through the passage that's up there. I've noticed that it's really small. Romans chapter 8, 18 through 25. We'll just take it a verse or two at a time, pull out some ideas. This lesson is in the series of lessons. We're going through Romans chapter 8. We actually started in chapter 7. And we're going somewhere with all this. And it all relates to everything that I've already said. But let's, let's, let's look at the passage. We'll talk about it for a little bit. And then we'll let God's people go. Amen? Romans chapter 8 verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so I want you to think about that. I always wonder, and I've got a camera up there, so I'm always wondering if it's okay for me to walk out, right? But, but I don't know if you've been through some difficult times. We've had some difficult times. The year before I went through preaching school was a terribly difficult time in my life. It, it was hard. And as hard as those days were, as dark as some of those days were, Paul is letting us know that there's a day coming, that, that there's a reality that's coming that's not even worth comparing the bad of today with what's coming for us. That Jesus is going to come back with His mighty angels, right? That, that, that Jesus is coming back in a twinkling of an eye. The, the, the trump of the archangel is going to sound. All these things are going to happen. The dead in Christ shall rise. And I'm... Yeah, I'm hitting different passages, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, those passages. Look them up. They're, they're worth it. But there's a moment 
When life is going on just like it was in the days of Noah, and then all of a sudden it's going to be different. And, and, and 1 Thessalonians, no, strike that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, he, he's talking about God's going to pay back those who are doing you trouble. You're going through a difficult time and somebody's doing that to you. He's going to pay out... Uh, you know, uh, what is it? He, uh, deal out uh, retribution. That's the word I couldn't get out, right? He's going to deal out retribution to those who do not go, know God, those who are not. Of, but he's also coming in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. This is not in my notes, by the way. That's why I'm struggling, right? That, 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 that he's coming back not only to deal out retribution, but to come back to be gloried at among all those who are, pay, I mean, excitedly. Ah, what's the word there? They're, they're longing for His coming, right? That, that's the idea there. They're, they're expecting is the word I can't get out now, right? So they're looking for something and it's going to be a wow moment. And, and, and if I'm not ready for it, it's going to be a wow, I should have gotten ready moment. And if I'm ready for it, if I'm walking by faith, it's going to be a moment that we're going, wow. And i got a feeling that every hard day, every tough time that we've ever been through, is going to seem like nothing in that moment. How glorious is the Christ? What's this going to look like when this whole host of angels comes? What's going to happen when we're, our bodies, if we're dead, uh, are raised from the dead, that we're raised up, we're changed into the likeness of Christ, 1 John 3, 2, transformed into His image, and, and, and we're raised up into the air to be with Him. If we're in Christ and living at the time He comes, then the dead in Christ rise first, and we're right behind them. We're being changed too. And I don't know what the glorified body of Jesus is like, I just know that He says that my body will become like His body. And oh, what a time! Not only that, not only that, not only is my body going to be changed and transformed into something glorious as His body, He's preparing a place for me to go to that He can receive me to Himself, that He can take me there to be with Him. He's prepared this place. Any idea what that place is like? And can you imagine yourself standing there in heaven, seeing all the glory of what God has prepared for us, and going, I don't know, I don't know if it's worth it. I mean, I went through all those hard times. i got a feeling we're not even going to think about those things, right? He says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that is being revealed to us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. There's an idea in Scripture but what we're waiting for, if we'll just wait for it, it's going to be so incomparably greater than the greatest thing we've had here and certainly greater than the worst things we have had here. I don't even think we'll hardly recall the things that we went through in this life. That's good news, by the way. And so the next verse says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. I, I know sons of God is a, a, one of those phrases that often means uh, the angels. I get the idea here, it's our adoption and we're the sons of God. We're, we're the children of God. And, you know, it's, it's like we've, we're in the adoption agency. All, all the papers have been signed. We're legally God's children. We just haven't been picked up yet, right? He hadn't come to gather us up and take us home with Him. You know, the, the room's prepared for us. We got our own bedroom there in heaven and everything's waiting for us. All the adoption papers are signed. We are legally His children and yet we're here. We're, we're waiting for that day that we get picked up. And He says that the creation, with all that in mind, the creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. They want to see what happens to or the creation, not they, but it wants to see what happens to us. And he goes on to say, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected, subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There, there's a lot there. I don't want to get too deep in it. We could go in there and take it all apart. If I understand this couple of verses correctly, he's saying that 
that, that the creation is longing, that the creation has been subjected to futility, and, and, and it's, it's, it's agonizing. The, the creation itself, this whole cosmos is agonizing. It's in a tension. It's in a state of decay, but it doesn't want to be there. It's anticipating at some point God's going to set everything right. God's going to set everything back, not only the way it was, but the way it's intended to be. And I get the idea if we go back to read Genesis chapter 1 and following, God made a perfect creation. It was exactly what God intended it to be. And man sinned and God cursed the earth. He, he, he not only called a curse on man, but he called a curse on earth. Because man wasn't going to be able to just walk around a garden anymore, plucking grapes or whatever fruit they want from any tree. No, he's going to have to go to work. He was going to have to work by the sweat of his brow. There's going to be weeds. There's going to be problems. And you're going to have to scrape out your living. It's not going to be the Garden of Eden. And so you kind of see this personification of the creation going, you know what, this is not the way we were. This is not the way the creation was. And, and oh, the creation's longing not only to be what it was, but he's coming to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And, and whatever that is, whatever that glorified state of this place is, and I don't know. You, you explain to me what does it mean, a new heaven and a new earth. I don't know the where or the what's. I just trust Him. The earth's longing. It's groaning. It's been subjected. In Genesis chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Kind of interesting. Somehow Noah's name has something to do with the idea that God had cursed the earth, but Noah was going to bring some kind of relief. And Lamech had no way of knowing what that would be like, but God cursed this earth. It, 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 it's subjected. It, it's in a futility. And, and so it takes us to this next idea, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Oh, it's groaning. It's been cursed by God. It's not as it once was, and it's certainly not as it's going to be. And so it's an odd picture that Paul paints here of the earth or the creation of the cosmos groaning, but it's in this state of frustration and it would seem pain, pains of childbirth. Ah, oh, it's in pain, waiting for a resolution of that. Like a woman in child pain, childbearing pain, labor pains, she, she's going through this pain, she's looking for that moment that she receives her child and the pain is gone and all of that, and the earth is doing that. But the earth is not by itself in this idea. It's not by itself in these pains and these groanings. Verse 23, and not, not, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And, and so those of us who have received the Holy Spirit of God, He's supposed to be creating some things in us, right? And one of those things is this groaning that the cosmos is groaning about, this expectation that whatever pain we're going through in this life, it's going to be taken away. God's going to wipe away every tear. God's going to comfort us. God's going to give us those things that He has promised. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 1, I think fits very well with our passage in Romans 8. For you know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put our, on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So as we look at this 
passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, it's saying the same thing Paul is saying here, that, that, that God's given us His Spirit and it causes us to groan and wish that we were somewhere else. It causes us to groan and wish we weren't still in this physical body. We want to be home with Him. We want to be home with Jesus. We want to receive that glorified spiritual body that He has promised to us. Galatians 5, verse 5, For through the Spirit... By faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. There's a longing. There's a, a looking forward to. This, this, this longing, this groaning that's happening at the same time. We groan over what it is that we're here, here enduring. And maybe I'm not going through just a bad time myself. But how do you turn on the 5 o'clock news or the 6 o'clock news or your iPhone news feed or however you get your news and see all the bad news and not think, oh, I'd love to be out of this mess. There's something that God has designed that, that, that we would oh, just be groaning over this life, looking forward to the one He's promised and looking forward to that. But we've got to wait for it. And as we already mentioned in that picture, we've already been adopted the, the, the papers are signed. We're looking forward to that. And oh, what a day when He comes to, to gather us up and to take us home. Because we are sons. We, we've been adopted and we're already adopted. And yet in another sense, we're not yet. The, the legal work is done. The actual picking us up and taking us home hasn't. But we'll never be more children of God. But we haven't yet received all the benefits of that. Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We are sons of God. We are sons and daughters of God and we have been adopted and we're just waiting for dad to come pick us up. Amen? And so as we get in the last few verses here, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we Wait for it with patience. There's your title, right? Wait for it. Wait for it. And, and I think the illustration is a good one because we get into the, I don't know, all the, the things that go on in this life. We wake up in the morning and we get ready. We go to our school or to our work or whatever we do. We go through the day. We've got meals at certain times, people to see, phone calls to do, texts emails, all the stuff we get through a day, and then the next day we get up and do much the same thing again. It just seems like one day after another after another, and sometimes we forget that this is all headed somewhere. That though we're groaning, there's a time when He's coming back. He's coming back to gather all those who are His sons and daughters. He's adopted us. He's coming to take us. And what he really has in mind is the redemption of our bodies and said another way is the resurrection of our bodies. Amen? In Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and following, it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He has passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus same power that raised Jesus from the dead will raise us up. We, we've been redeemed. We, we are those who are redeemed. But we're those who are redeemed who have 
a living hope. Verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I, I wonder how much time we spend really thinking about the resurrection, the coming of Christ. Now, Paul will end 1 Corinthians 13 saying this, right? These three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. But one of those great three is our hope. Well, what is our hope in? Well, what is our hope? Our hope is those things that haven't been seen yet. The completion of our adoption as sons, the glorification of our bodies, the resurrection of our bodies from the grave. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Jesus is coming back. He's going to put to death that final enemy, which is death. Jesus is coming back that He may redeem our mortal bodies. Jesus is coming back that He may uh, receive those who have been adopted. Jesus is coming back that we might go to be with Him in that home that He's prepared for us. Jesus is coming back to accomplish some things in everything that He has promised us that is not yet the stuff that we're to wait for it is the Christian hope. It's what ought to make us get up out of bed in the morning. I, I know that life is humdrum. I know that life just one day leads to another. I know that sometimes in my life days are difficult. I know when sometimes in my life there are problems in front of me that I don't have any idea how a resolution can come to them. I know that life can come in many different forms. And sometimes it seems endless. But wait for it. And think not only of the fact that It's going to change, but it's going to change in those ways that we just mentioned. Jesus is coming back, and He's going to fulfill all of those promises that He made. And you can't see them. You haven't seen them. In those things we hope, we hope for those things that we cannot see, but hope is not a wish. Hope in the biblical word here is a confident expectation. He said, I've given you my spirit as a guarantee. I've given you the down payment, the earnest money that you can just bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to do everything that I said I would do. So I can get up in the morning if life is humdrum knowing that I have a hope. I can get up in the morning knowing that maybe days are difficult, but I have hope. And I can get up in the mornings knowing that there are problems before me I don't know the answers to, and I still have hope. And that hope makes a complete difference in the way that life is. I said the first one, and I don't really believe it. Can you fix your mind on the hope set before us and get up and life be humdrum? I don't think so. I get the idea that we get up in the morning And it's like watching one of those little videos. Wait for it. Something's going to happen. I hope that you live in that hope, that you walk about in that expectation of all that God is going to do. There's much to be said about what He's going to do in our lives, during our lives. Not all of it is future in the sense of at Christ's coming. God's at work in your life right now. Do we wait for it? Do we wait for God's answer? Do we wait for His resolution? And are we ultimately waiting for all those things that come at Christ's return? I hope that we are. I used hope in a different way, didn't I? I hope that you have a confident expectation of hope. This morning, I don't know where you're at in your walk, and I don't know. This made an impression on me. I I enjoyed this lesson. I hope you have. I, I can just... Visualize those little videos and maybe you have your own. And something unexpected, even if I'm expecting it, something beyond my expectation is going to happen when Christ comes. May that knowledge help us through the difficult times. And may it give meaning to every moment in our lives. 
I get to get up not only expecting that God's going to do something at the end, but get up in the morning expecting that God is going to do something today. And that ought to give a lot of meaning to our lives. This morning, if you're not in Christ, I beg with you and plead with you to come to Him. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Be baptized in the Christ. Raised up to walk a brand new life. One of expectancy, one of hope. One looking forward to your adoption as sons. Maybe you're in Christ and your life hasn't been like that. Maybe it's that humdrum idea. Maybe there's some difficult dark days that you're living through right now and you could use the encouragement of those here. Or maybe there's problems going on in your life you don't know the answers to. There's wise counsel. There's encouragement. There, there's a paraclete or two in here. Somebody who walked along beside you through those difficult times and, and help you through those decisions. If there's a way that we can serve you, why don't you come now while we stand and while we sing?